privacy matters because it protects you from possible abuses of power. And as long as human beings are human beings and institutions are institutions, there will always be the possibility, the temptation to abuse power. There is no democracy without privacy. And in fact, privacy matters so much that it might save your life one day. It can save your life in three ways, at least. The first way is that it can physically save your life. One of the first things that the Nazis did when they invaded a city was go to the registry. Why? That's where the data was held. How are you going to find Jewish people if you don't know where they live? You go to the registry. In 1943, there was a resistance cell in Amsterdam that realized the danger of the registry. It turns out that in the Netherlands, there had been one person called Lenz, who was a pioneer of population statistics. He came up with the idea of the ID card. He wanted to build a system that could follow people from cradle to grave. And this resistance cell decided to destroy the records. Twelve people went into the registry, they sedated the guards, and they set fire to the records. They had sympathizers in the fire department, and the deal was that the fire department would arrive late, and that they would use more water than necessary to destroy as many records as possible. But they were very unsuccessful. They only managed to destroy about 15% of the records. And the Nazis found and assassinated 73% of the Jewish population. The Dutch made two mistakes. First, they had much more data than was necessary for a well-ordered society. Second, they didn't have an easy way to delete the data in the event of an emergency. And we are making both of those mistakes at a grand scale never seen before, at a time when democracy is struggling. We have never had this amount of personal data before. Just imagine an authoritarian regime that doesn't only know where you live, whether you're Jewish or Catholic or Muslim, who your grandparents are, who your friends are. They know what you've searched for, what you've read, what makes you scared, your health record, how much you owe, your bank account, your purchasing power. They know everything about you in real time. That should make us think twice about what we're doing with our personal data. In contrast, France had made a conscious decision back in 1872 not to collect certain kinds of data about people, including things like whether you were Jewish and where your grandparents lived. And because of that decision, in France, the Nazis only found 25% of the Jewish population versus 73%. The contrast is in the hundreds of thousands. It matters, and we should learn from history. In 2019, a couple of journalists from the New York Times who described themselves as not very tech-savvy decided to figure out whether they could learn the location of the President of the United States. And it was remarkably easy. They got a hold of data from a data broker, location data, that anyone can buy. And they triangulated the President's public schedule to location. And they figured out that there was a phone that was always with the president. And it turned out to be the phone of a Secret Service agent. Then they found the location of important lawyers, military personnel. And if the president of the United States is not safe, neither is the country. And neither is any citizen, including you and me. The second way in which privacy can save your life is through saving the democracy that protects your rights. And we shouldn't take it for granted. Democracy is something that is built every day, that we have to fight for every day. And it's a battle that's never won, once and for all. And literally, there is no privacy. There is no democracy without privacy. If you don't have privacy, you don't have investigative journalists, because journalists cannot protect themselves or their sources. It is not a coincidence that the, one of the countries in the world in which most journalists are assassinated is Mexico. And that is the same country that was most represented in the Pegasus scandal, in which software was used to break into the phones of journalists, of academics, of human rights activists. If you don't have privacy, you can't go to a lawyer 
and be sure that you have confidentiality. If you don't have privacy, you don't have freedom of speech, you don't have freedom of association, you cannot have peaceful protest, peaceful anonymous protest, which is a pillar of democracy. We are eroding the pillars of democracy, and democracy is such a wonderful thing that is on the one hand very fragile, but also very robust, so it's possible to erode the pillars without noticing until one day it's too late. So this is our chance to protect democracy. And the third way in which privacy can save your life is that privacy can save your way of life. Every time you protect your privacy, you might be saving yourself from a case of identity theft. You're also protecting your friends, your family, your colleagues, your citizens, because privacy is not an individual thing. Every time you share your data, you're sharing other people's data as well, without their knowledge and without their consent. And I want to provoke you today. I want to consider the idea that to digitize is to surveil. We, we have been sold the narrative by tech companies that technology is neutral, that it depends on how we use it, but no technology is ever neutral. We build technology to do something, otherwise we wouldn't take the trouble. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of money, to come up with a product. And technologies that surveil are not neutral. There is a very important word in philosophy, and that is affordances. Artifacts have affordances. They invite you to do something. Pawn, pots and, and, and pots uh, and pans invite you to cook. You would never cook with a gun. It's not made for that. It's made to threaten or kill. There are cases in which it's justified, but it's not neutral. And surveillance technologies are not neutral. They invite you to control. When we turn the analog into the digital, it might seem like a very innocent thing to do, but what we're doing is building a surveillance structure. Because every time we turn the analog into the digital, we make something that wasn't trackable, trackable, searchable, and taggable. And what is it to track something if it's not to surveil it? We tend to think that the cutting edge, the newest, the best, is the digital. But the digital is but a ghost of the analog. Life is analog. And we are making the mistake of neglecting the analog world in virtue of a virtual world that completely depends on the analog. We forget that these clouds are not clouds, that they depend on minerals, on people. That artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor very intelligent. <laughs> we forget that when we neglect the analog, we're neglecting our relationships, our local businesses, our streets, our housing, the ecological world. And not only is the analog world much more private, it's also much more robust. I'll give you an example. My favorite object in the world is a paper book. And if you compare a paper book to an electronic book, there's no competition. An electronic book, you have to charge it. If you take it to the sea, to the beach, and a grain of sand enters it, it's toast. It's very easy to break. It can be hacked. And you're being surveilled at all times. There are literally hundreds of companies watching what you're reading, how, how fast you read, what are you highlighting, where do you stop, who do you share with. Paper book is respectful. It's actually yours. And the electronic book is never yours. I don't know if you've had the experience of the words changing before your very eyes, because maybe the publisher got a lawsuit, or maybe it got updated for other reasons. And it's not, it reminds you that it's not really yours. You paid for it, but it's not yours, and it doesn't work for you. A paper book works for you, and it's incredibly robust. You don't have to charge it. If you drop it from the top of the Eiffel Tower, you might kill someone, but the book will be fine. <laughs> and every time we choose the digital over the analog, not only are we subjecting ourselves to a system of surveillance that we don't control, and you never know who's going to be in government next, you never know how geopolitics is going to develop, but we're also making our life 
much more fragile because anything connected to the internet can be hacked. And in fact, it will be hacked. It's a matter of time. If institutions like the NSA and the FBI couldn't keep their data safe, neither can you, and neither can any other institution that is telling you that your data is safe. It isn't. Let's go back to the Second World War. When the Nazis went into France, they went to the government and they said, we want to know how many Jewish people live here and where they live. And the government said, we don't have that data, good luck with that. And there was one person, he was the general comptoir of the army, and her, his name was René Carmille. And he had Hollerith machines, IBM punch card machines, that could help the Nazis do a new census to figure out the data that they wanted to have. So he volunteered to do the census, he went out, and months went by, and he didn't have the data. And months went by, and he didn't have the data. And the Nazis grew impatient. They started performing raids, but they were very ineffective because they had to rely on people either trading themselves in or have a neighbor turn them in. And it turns out that René Carmille was one of the highest people in the French resistance. He was never going to give up the data. In fact, some people call him the first hacker because he modified the Hollerith machine so that it would never collect the answer to question 11, whether somebody was Jewish. And in that one act, one person saved hundreds of thousands of lives because personal data is a toxic asset and we should treat it as like a toxic substance. Yes, it's cheap. Yes, it's, it can be useful, but it's incredibly dangerous to us as individuals, as communities, and as democracies, and we should treat it as such. I often get asked, what is the future of privacy? What is the future of AI? The kind of AI that we're using uses incredible amounts of personal data, but it doesn't have to be that way. AI is not God-given. We are designing it. We can do better. We can redesign the digital so that it doesn't mean that to make something digital means to surveil. In 1934, there were as many electric cars as there were petrol cars in New York City. And the fact that petrol car won was a fluke. It had to do with Henry Ford being a very good businessman, with the US finding petrol. But the point is, any technology is human-made, and we can make it different. We can design it different. Better worlds are possible. And good design is about ethics. Really, when you think about it, ethics is nothing above and beyond very good design. So don't ask me about the future of privacy. You tell me, what is the future of our privacy, of our democracy? What kind of technology will we build to support democracy and freedom? Because it depends on us. And I invite you to think about how do we build technology so that it will support our thriving and our well-being. Thank you so much.